Welcome to Music History Monday for September 11th, 2023. My name is Bob Greenberg, and the title for this podcast is They Did Not Go Gently. 9-11, a somber day for us all. A day for reflection, contemplation, and perhaps still, after 22 years, a day to grieve. Far more often than not, Music History Monday is about celebrating the life and accomplishments of a musician or identifying and exploring some great or small event in music history. If I chose to, today's post could celebrate the lives and music of two wonderful composers. On September 11, 1733, 290 years ago today, the French composer and harpsichordist François Couperin, 1668-1733, died in Paris at the age of 65. The Estonian-born composer Arvo Pärt was born 88 years ago today on September 11, 1935. If we chose to explore an event rather than celebrate the lives and music of Francois Couperin or Arvo Pert, this post could mark the 173rd anniversary of the first American concert of the Swedish Nightingale, Ms. Jenny Lind, 1820-1887, at the Castle Garden Theatre in New York City, in a performance promoted by none other than P. T. Barnum. For our information, Johanna Maria Jenny Lind was one of the most highly regarded operatic sopranos of her time. After a sensational European career, she retired from the opera stage in 1849 at the still tender age of 29. But she didn't retire from singing. In 1850, at the invitation of the great American showman Phineas Taylor, or P.T. Barnum, 1810-1891, Jenny Lynn traveled to America to tour. She performed 93 concerts under the banner of Barnum's production company, then continued to tour the United States, Cuba, and Canada under her own management. During her two-year stay, Lind became the most popular musician ever to visit North America to that point in time, and the wealthiest as well. Her concerts netted her roughly $350,000, in 2023 dollars. But back to today and this post. I would begin with an admission. I'm feeling my age these days, and, for better or for worse, becoming ever more aware of the brevity of all things, as well as the pervasive chaos that lies immediately beneath our perceived veneer of control. So? So, running with the avowedly morbid spirit of this day, I present to you a series of chaotic deaths, unnecessary deaths, stupid deaths, tragic, sudden, accidental deaths from the world of concert music. If I were so foolish as to include unnecessary slash stupid deaths from the world of rock and roll, this post would run for a million plus words instead of 2,293 words. There are no deaths here from chronic illness, suicide, substance abuse, heart attack, stroke, or aneurysm. Just particularly unnecessary deaths, like being hit by a Boeing 767 while sitting at your desk on the 93rd floor of the North Tower of the World Trade Center at 8.46.40 a.m. on September 11, 2001. Admittedly, it's a grim topic, but not an uninteresting one, given that death is one of the very few things that we all will have in common. 
We begin then with the date-related item that anchors today's Music History Monday. Betty Stone, 1914 to 1977. Going up? We mark the birth on September 11, 1914, 109 years ago today, of Betty Stone in Norwich, Connecticut. Ms. Stone, whose birth name was Betty Schenker, was an alto and a member of the Metropolitan Opera Chorus. According to her brother, Sidney Schenker of Union, New Jersey, quote, Ever since she was a child, she had been wrapped up in opera. Our older sister Rose played the piano and sang, and Betty always wanted to, unquote. Betty Stone studied choral singing in a chorus sponsored by the Works Progress Administration during the Great Depression in the 1930s and joined the Metropolitan Opera in 1945 when she was 31 years old. We read from an article that appeared on page 44 of the New York Times on May 2, 1977. Cleveland, May 1st. A member of the chorus of New York's Metropolitan Opera Company was killed here last night when her flowing costume was caught in the grill of a backstage elevator. The accident occurred just after the curtain went down on the second act of Il Trovatore, the final opera of the Met's one-week stay in Cleveland's public hall. Backstage, some cast members walked upstairs to their dressing rooms, while others lined up for the half-century-old elevator. The elevator was almost filled when Frank Coffey, a seven-year chorus member, stepped on. Behind him, Miss Stone was the last to squeeze into the 8x6 elevator. It is an old freight-style elevator with doors at both ends, and the operator was on the opposite end from Miss Stone. As the car began to rise, Mr. Coffey saw Miss Stone being dragged down. Stop! Stop! he yelled. Others took up the shout. There were sobs, shouts of panic. The robe Miss Stone wore as a nun in the cloister scene had caught in the door, and as the elevator rose, she was dragged to the floor. Oh, my God! Oh, my God! The elevator operator, Norman Reeser, heard someone shout. He stopped the elevator, but Miss Stone, dragged down as the cage went up, had caught her head between the side of the shaft and the elevator. A stagehand, Joe Bauer, took out a pocket knife and cut her loose from the gown. The elevator was lowered. The stagehand, Joe Bauer, lifted her out onto the stage floor. Miss Stone was bleeding profusely and was unconscious. She was taken to St. Vincent's Charity Hospital, where she was pronounced dead at 10.07 p.m. Frank M. Duman, a member of the Public Auditorium Commission in Cleveland, said the elevator was to have gone out of service that night as part of a remodeling of the old section of the building. It had been scheduled to be used for only another hour." Unquote. Oh my God, that's just awful. Singing in an opera chorus should not be hazardous to your health, especially while dressed as a nun. As for a New Yorker to die this way, in Cleveland of all places, oh, the ignominy of it all. Happy birthday, Betty Shanker Stone. You no doubt deserved better. In the spirit of Misery Loves Company, I would offer up a few other egregiously stupid musician deaths. Charles Valentin Alcom, eighteen thirteen. 1888. We would mark the death on March 29, 1888, of the 74 year old Charles Henri Valentin Morhang, best known as Alkin. 
a superb pianist, considered in his prime to be the equal of Chopin and Liszt, Alkin wrote piano music that was so difficult it was considered unplayable even by the excessive virtuosic standards of the 19th century. A native of Paris and lifelong Parisian, Alkin was a brilliant child prodigy. Trained from the age of five at the Paris Conservatoire, Alkin went on to number among his greatest friends Franz Liszt, Frédéric Chopin, Eugène Delacroix, Victor Hugo, George Sand, and Alexandre Dumas. He reached the peak of his fame in 1838 at the age of 25. He was the toast of Paris, and his name was uttered alongside those of Chopin and Liszt. But then, sadly, depression set in, and Alcan slowly but inexorably began to withdraw. By 1860, the once great and famous Charles Valentin Alcan was a virtual recluse. In 1861, he wrote his friend Ferdinand Hiller, quote, I'm becoming daily more and more misanthropic and misogynous. Nothing worthwhile, good or useful to do. No one to devote myself to. My situation makes me horridly sad and wretched. Even musical production has lost its attraction for me, for I can't see the point or goal." Unquote. In the privacy of his bachelor's pad on the Square d'Orléans in Paris's ninth arrondissement, the devoutly Jewish Alkin composed, wrote letters, and immersed himself in a study of the Bible and the Talmud. For years, the story circulated that it was Alkin's Jewish heritage that indirectly killed him on March 29, 1888, at the age of 74. According to the story, Alkin was reaching for a Hebrew religious book on the top shelf of a large and heavy bookcase, when the entire bookcase fell on him and squashed him like a bug. In fact, the real story of Alkin's death is even stupider. He was in his kitchen when he either slipped or fainted. As he fell, he grabbed at a porte parapluie manteau, a heavy coat slash cloak slash umbrella rack, which came down on top of him. Found moaning under the porte parapluie by his concierge, he was carried to his bedroom where he died a few hours later. Death by umbrella stand. How freaking lame. Would you like to hear more about the ill-fated Monsieur Alkin? Good. He will be the subject of tomorrow's Dr. Bob Prescribes post. Johann Sebastian Bach, 1685-1750 to We would observe that the death of our beloved Johann Sebastian Bach at the age of 65 was due to a medical malpractice nightmare. Bach's eyesight had been poor for many years, partly due to the endless strain of writing and copying music late at night in near darkness, but very likely also due to diabetes. By 1749, at the age of 64, he was nearly blind. Enter one Chevalier John Taylor, an English oculist then traveling through Germany, who reportedly was performing amazing eye operations. Bach entrusted himself to Taylor, who performed two disastrously unsanitary operations on Bach's eyes, both failures. Afterwards, Bach's doctor reported that he suffered accidental inflammation, no doubt referring to the infection that set in. From there, it was all downhill. Bach suffered a stroke, followed by horrific fevers. He died on July 28, 1750, surrounded by his family. Uh, for our information, the same quack Dr. John Taylor conducted cataract surgery on George Frederick Handel in 1751, permanently blinding him. 
Al van Berg, 1885-1935. Infection and more infection. A handful of antibiotics would have saved the lives of countless millions, including Franz Schubert, Robert Schumann, Friedrich Smetna, Gustav Mahler, and Alban Berg. The death of Berg, the great German expressionist composer, is a particularly sorry tale. Just a couple of days after he finished his brilliant violin concerto on August 11, 1935, Berg was stung on his lower back by what was likely a wasp to which he was allergic. First a carbuncle, then a boil developed, followed by a nasty abscess. Berg's wife, Helene, attempted to lance it with a pair of scissors, and whether it was from the abscess itself or Helene Berg's less than sanitary outpatient surgery, Berg developed general septicemia, from which in those days before antibiotics, there was little chance of recovery. Surgery and a blood transfusion followed, but to no avail. Berg died on December 24, 1935, age 50 years and 11 months, never having heard a performance of his violin concerto. Anton Webern, 1883-1945. Arnold Schoenberg, 1874-1951, and Anton Webern grieved mightily for their friend Alban Berg. Sadly, Webern was to die ten years later under circumstances even more ridiculous than those of Berg. Webern's music was banned by the Nazis as being entartete Kunst, degenerate art. A native of Vienna, Webern remained in Austria during World War II, where he kept a very low profile and thus managed to survive the war. As the war drew to its close, Webern, his wife, daughter, son-in-law, and three grandchildren took up residence in the Austrian alpine town of Mittersill, believing it to be a safe place to wait out the chaotic days that were sure to follow the end of hostilities. It was there in Mittersill that Webern's son-in-law, Benno Mattel, a former member of the SS, got himself involved in the post-war black market. On the evening of September 15, 1945, the American authorities organized a sting operation and arrested Mattel in the kitchen of the Webern house, where the entire family had just finished eating dinner. At exactly the moment the arrest was taking place in the kitchen, Webern, completely unaware that a sting operation was taking place just a few feet away, stepped outside the house to smoke a cigar. Hearing the front door close, one of the American soldiers involved in the sting, Private First Class Raymond Norwood Bell, a company cook from North Carolina, went outside to investigate. Bell bumped into Webern, panicked, and shot him three times. By the time medical help arrived, Webern was dead. Ten years later, on September 3rd, 1955, Raymond Norwood Bell died of acute alcoholism. According to his wife, a schoolteacher named Helen Bell, her husband's alcoholism was a result of the guilt he felt over Webern's death. More evidence, not that we needed it, that smoking kills. Postscript. As I mentioned at the top of this post, I've limited this list of strange, stupid deaths to individuals from the world of concert music. But the grim reaper that is Music History Monday is not yet finished with us. Next week's Music History Monday will mark the all-too-early death of Jimi Hendrix on September 18, 1970, at the age of 27. Hendrix's death will allow us to explore the so-called 27 Club, that extraordinary list of ragtime, blues, 
rhythm and blues, jazz, rock and roll, rap, and hip-hop musicians who all died at the age of 27. Thank you.